Good afternoon, everybody. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Great. I'm Jordan McGee. I'm Director of Education here at the National Atomic Testing Museum on behalf of our entire staff and board of directors. I want to welcome you all and thank you so much for being here to spend the afternoon with us. For those of you who come to our lecture events regularly, we're going to do this one a little bit differently in that we're not stranding our guest up here with a PowerPoint. I'm going to hang up here, ask him some questions. We will leave time for you at the end to ask questions yourself. And then afterward, if you have a copy of the book we are talking about today, um, Dr. Houghton will sign the book. They are available for sale in our museum store, so if you don't have one, you will have time at the end to go get it and bring it in. And if you have one, great, you're ahead of the game. Our speaker today, or our guest today, I guess you're not formally speaking, is Dr. Vince Houghton, who is the historian and curator of the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., which just opened in its brand new home and building three weeks ago. It is a magnificent museum. If you've been to the original and you liked it, this one is so much better. It's just, it's really extraordinary. So if you find yourself in D.C. in the next several months, make sure you stop by and, as Vince likes to say, while well, it still has that new museum smell. Um, <laughs> Dr. Houghton is also a member of our museum's newly formed National Advisory Council. He, they just met here for the first time this week, so thank you to him for that as well. Um, Dr. Houghton has a PhD in diplomatic and military history from the University of Maryland, where his research centered on U.S. scientific and technological intelligence, nuclear intelligence, in the Second World War and early Cold War. His master's, also from the University of Maryland, focused on the relationship between the United States and Soviet Union. He has taught extensively at the middle school, high school, and university level, most recently at the University of Maryland, where he taught courses on the history of U.S. intelligence, U.S. diplomatic history, the Cold War, and the history of science. He has appeared on CNN, NBC, News, Fox News, the History Channel, and the Washington Post, and been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, and Vanity Fair as an expert in intelligence history. He is also the host and creative director of the International Spy Museum's podcast, SpyCast, which reaches more than two million listeners annual worldwide. In addition to the book we are discussing today, he is also the author of the forthcoming book, The Nuclear Spies, America's Atomic Intelligence Operation Against Hitler and Stalin, coming this fall, September, right? September. From yeah. Cornell University Press. Dr. Houghton is also a veteran of the United States Army and served in the Balkans, where he worked closely with both civilian and military intelligence agencies in several capacities. Please join me in welcoming our guest today, Dr. Vince Houghton. So the book today, this was released a couple of weeks ago, Nuking the Moon and Other Intelligence Schemes and Military Plots Left on the Drawing Board. Has anyone here read it yet? Oh good, you're in for a treat. This book is absolutely hilarious as well as informative and there's a lot of stories we're going to dig into but I want to start by asking you to kind of set up the book sure. and how you decided to write this book. Yeah, I didn't mean it as a comedy. I'm not a comedian. Uh, the stories themselves really lent to the comedy element, too. I was actually doing research for the other book coming out, which is much more serious. It's a Cornell University Press. It's an academic footnoted book about nuclear intelligence. And I kept running into these stories in the archives. And I'm, I've got a PhD in intelligence history. I shouldn't be surprised by what I run into in the archives. I'm supposed to know about this kind of stuff. And I kept running into these stories where I'm like, I've never heard of this before. And I st I'm like, well, I, it's worth a couple days. Let me spend a couple days and kind of chase this down because if it's true at the end of this, that this thing actually happened, I am starting to count my Pulitzers, right? I'm like, oh, if I, you know, this is gonna be an EGOT. I'm gonna sell this for a million dollars. It's the greatest story since Argo. And I would chase it for a couple days and all of a sudden I'd find a document saying, we decided to cancel this program. I'm like, darn it. You know, the first couple times that was annoying. First couple times I'm like, ah, oh, there goes my, there goes my Oscar, there goes my Pulitzer. And then when I ran into four or five or six of these, I started going, oh, well, there's a lot of really interesting stories that people don't know anything about because they never happened. Now, of course, history books are full of events that do happen. That's what history is. But what I found is actually the, these programs that never took place were more fascinating than anything that we read about in history. And it, one thing, if they were so crazy they were canceled because somebody had a you know, 
came to their senses and said, whoa, we really shouldn't do this. But the vast majority of the stories in this book were actually canceled because the war ended, or the atomic bomb worked, or another technology superseded it that was cheaper or easier to use. It wasn't in most cases that someone somewhere said, no, we probably shouldn't do this. This is a really bad idea. <laughs> and in some cases, literally, they were gearing up to do the program and the atomic bomb ended in World War II. Or they were gearing up to do a biological weapons attack, let's say, the United States in World War II, and the Germans pulled out because they were losing at Stalingrad. So it wasn't like FDR or somebody all of a sudden said, no, we're not gonna be that country. No, it was somebody else did something that caused us to cancel all these programs. And so I had a handful of these that were you know, kind of mulling about in my mind. I was busy writing this other book. And then there were about, I mentioned I was an intelligence historian, there were about 50 of us in the country. We're a very small niche group. And we tend to get together every so often. And when we do, we're pretty nerdy. Uh, we don't sit around and talk about sports or girls or anything. We talk about intelligence programs. And so I kind of threw out, I'm like, I got this idea that maybe there's enough of these stories to write a book. And then all of a sudden it was like, have you thought about this one? Have you thought about that one? I'm like writing all these down. And now there's enough for two sequels to this, which <laughs> makes me pretty happy. Um, and, and that's kind of how this came together. It was one of these things where I had no idea, this is from Penguin Random House, which is a big publisher, and I'm an academic. So I had no idea how to do the kind of the big publisher stuff. And I basically had a guest on my podcast, SpyCast, that said, hey, she talked to my agent. I'm like, I'm not an agent kind of person, right? I kind of laugh at those people. And I talked to her agent for about 10 minutes, and then three days later, it was, the book was sold. And I was like, that was easy. And everyone I've talked to is like, that's not how it happens in real life. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I had to write the thing, which was exciting. How yeah. do you do research for a book where the stuff, nothing in here actually, ha there's no after action reports. I mean, how do, right. you, how do you follow that path to actually get these stories? Well, the good thing is for me is that I had a lot of practice doing that with this other book. Um, this other book, um, a lot of stuff during World War II and the early Cold War wasn't written down. And if there are documents, they're heavily redacted. In many cases, there are documents that were written as more of a CYA than actually doing anything for historians later on. Like, like somebody after the fact's like, well, I better write a document and, and date it back a couple weeks so that I don't get indicted for doing this. Um, and so I had to write that other book by filling in blanks in a lot of different ways, whether it was oral interviews, whether it was kind of detective work to try to, sometimes documents are in the weirdest places. They're not in the OSS archives. They're not in CIA archives. CIA, if they're gonna do an operation overseas, might actually have to reach out to the Department of Transportation to get clearance for the FAA to do something. You're like, ooh, maybe there's a document there that I can kind of come into because they're less, there's not a lot of FAA documents that are heavily redacted and censored. So maybe there's something, and there, a lot of times there was. So a lot of this was trying to figure out how do I write this? Number one, to tell the story the way it should be told. But number two, to get beyond the secrecy that's inherent in all these programs, and number three, making it even hard, it's hard enough to write about things that happened. The added layer of writing out things that didn't happen makes it more difficult. I'm very honest in the book, I try to be, where I don't know the whole story. Um, the first chapter is a great example of this, where I literally say there's two stories that make up this one story. But the two stories actually came from the f former number four guy at CIA, unfortunately, who, who left under bad circumstances. I think you should just tell this story. Okay, so the, the first story in the book is a, a pro project in the 1960s that the CIA ran called Acoustic Kitty. And that was the official name of the program, Acoustic Kitty. And this is an idea to turn a common everyday house cat into a covert listening device. <laughs> and this doesn't mean just putting like a collar with a little bug on it. This means a surgical suite with a veterinarian to open up the cat, to put the power pack inside its abdomen, to run the microphone up into its ears so his ear canal would actually take the audio and, and funnel it down into the microphone and then run the antenna up into its tail. <laughs> and that actually happened, right? There's no, we have, there are CIA documents that are relatively unredacted that say that happened. That's as much as we know. We know the program ended. According to a member of our board, Bob Wallace, who was the director of the Office of Technical Services at CIA. So anyone seen a James Bond movie? Q in James Bond. Well, Bob was the CIA version of Q. So he was the head of the shop that made all this stuff. And he came in after Acoustic Kitty, but he knew everybody who had been there. And he certainly had access to all the documents. Well, he swears 
They try to train the cat, and that should make everyone kind of chuckle if they've been around a cat for about 10 seconds. And they failed to be able to train the cat, and they decided they were wasting money to end the program there. If that was the only story, it wouldn't really make it in this book. The problem is, we don't know, because there's a competing vision of the story. There's a man named Victor Marchetti, who was very high up. He was a senior at the CIA. And he left and wrote a book called The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. Give you a little bit of an idea about how disgruntled he was when he left the agency. And he wrote about Acoustic Kitty, and he talked about it being a monstrosity, that they essentially rewired the brain of the cat to listen to commands, which was possible at the time, because at the same time, the CIA is working on a program called MKUltra. And MKUltra was a CIA mind control program. And most people have heard of MKUltra in a way, think about LSD and hallucinogenic drugs. But MKUltra was about 150 different programs, and one of them actually was electronic stimulation in animals. And actually, we have documentation that proves this. And so the story goes, they went back in to the, to the kitty, and they rewired the brain to get beyond the instinct to like go get food when it's hungry, or lick itself when it has some imaginary microscopic piece of dust on its side, or anything else, to the point where it would do exactly what we wanted it to. Right? We could control the robotic cat to the point where we wanted to do a field test. And so Marchetti's story says that the CIA brought their secret CIA spy van with Acoustic Kitty in it. Maybe it was all black. Maybe it had like Bob's florist on the side of it or like you know, Ernesto's laundry service or something to Northwest DC and to a nice park. And there's two men sitting on a park bench. They could have been anybody. It didn't matter who they were because they're just going to test the cat. And so they keyed in their 1960s era electronics, they flipped some switches, they twisted the oscilloscope to make it do whatever oscilloscopes do, and then they put Acoustic Kitty down on the street, and they hit the enter button, and Acoustic Kitty geared up, and then went straight for the two men on the bench. Perfect, exactly the way it was designed to do. Now the two guys in the van, I imagine, there's no evidence of this, but I'm imagining this in my head, are just thinking about the raises that they're gonna get, they're high-fiving each other, they're like, oh my god, we made this work, we trained a cat, they're nerdy tech guys, so maybe they're thinking about like the Harley they're going to buy, so the operations guys will think they're cool. But they're not paying attention to traffic. <laughs> There's the end of the story, right? You know what's coming. So Acoustic Kitty is making the perfect patriotic beeline right for the two men sitting on the bench, and a DC taxi cab runs it over as it gets halfway across the street. Now, again, empathetic, trying to put myself back in the shoes of these two men sitting inside this van. Their raise is gone. Their Harley is gone. They're not gonna be, they're gonna be made fun of even more by the operations guys. To add insult to injury, they gotta go scrape the robotic roadkill off the street because God forbid the Soviets see what they're doing. Or the Washington Post would be even worse, right? You got a little smoking, sparking roadkill on the street. So that's what ended up getting Acoustic Kitty canceled. Um, I love I love cats. So Bob Wallace's the version where they just yeah well, they retired the cat and where he didn't die where he didn't die is my f favorite part of the story, but it's not as entertaining. Uh, so I include both, and I'm very honest in the book about the fact that I don't know, right? I don't know what the right answer to this is. I know it existed. I know the program was canceled. I know when because there are documents that says when the program was canceled, but I have no idea the middle part. And so I'm very honest about there's two possible outcomes here. So before we get into any of the other stories, I want to talk about the people who were involved in these because there are people when you're reading this book, you will know their names. And these are very high level people who were top government officials, top military officials, officials, innovative scientists. And you don't expect these ideas to come from these people. Some of these ideas in here are like, the intern dreamed this up, right? Wait, you right? think, yeah, at three in the morning, some drunk so, intern came in. And so I guess my first question, and some of these projects were fairly well developed. They had a lot of resources, mm -hmm. monetary resources and personnel resources developed to them, or devoted to them. So my, my question is really twofold. One, do you think that some of these got as far as they did because of who was involved with them? Or would they have it anyway because of the desperation aspect which you address? And you can talk a little bit about that if you want to. And then second of all, how, do, and maybe this is tied into desperation, 
how did these ideas come from these people? Yeah. It's so unexpected. Right. And so you, you're wondering, it, it's just, you would expect better ideas or maybe more sound <laughs> ideas. For, you don't expect like wiring up the house cat, right, from some of these folks. And you're gonna, when we dig into some of the stories, you'll start talking about some of the people involved. So you'll understand the context of what I'm talking about when I say these are really well-respected folks. So what's going on there? We, I mean, we can get a little ahead and say it's the people we're talking about like Carl Sagan, Jard Kuiper, the Kuiper belts named after him, Werner von Braun, who is the father of the rocket program. But even people like John Kennedy, Winston Churchill, and Franklin Roosevelt, and- Edward and Teller. Edward Teller. <laughs> I, I'm not a fan. If you are, that's fine. Um, yeah, so these are, these are prominent people who you don't necessarily associate with ridiculous plans. And, and I think that one of the things, I, I had no intention of making this serious at all. Right? When, I wrote, when I wrote this book, it was going to be tongue firmly planted in my cheek, my eye twinkling the whole time. But then when I got done with the chapters, I realized that they all kind of were brought together by a coherent theme. And so I wrote a little bit of an introduction, a little conclusion, but I think it's kind of important to understand that I picked civil, Cold War stories and World War II stories for a very specific reason. That's when we had a true existential threat here in the United States. That word gets thrown around a lot. It's thrown around a lot talking about Al Qaeda is an existential threat. No, they're not. Iran's an existential threat. No, they're not. It literally means a threat to our existence. And during World War II, we thought there was a threat to our existence. The Nazi Germans, the Imperial Japanese. And during the Cold War, the 65,000 Soviet nuclear weapons were certainly a threat to everyone's existence. And during these times, we sometimes make questionable decisions. Not because we're stupid, not because we're crazy, but because we're desperate is we're desperate to do something. We're desperate to do anything that can possibly make that existential threat less. Give us an edge up over our adversaries. We're desperate to do anything that can keep us alive. And most of these problems are incredibly difficult to solve. If they were easy to solve, the State Department would do it. If they're easy to solve, the military would do it. But when they get down to the level of the intelligence agencies, all the normal stuff's already been tried. So you've got to think outside the box. You gotta think in unique ways. I mean, some of you may know the story of the SR-71. That's not in this book because it was incredibly successful. That's one of the craziest ideas ever, that the plane leaks fuel on the ground because the fuel tanks aren't sealed. Someone came up with that at two in the morning drinking their favorite adult beverage. That can't be a normal idea at three o'clock and on Tuesday afternoon. That worked. Some of these are in the same vein as those. Ideas that, you know what, if we had actually tried some of these, they may have worked. But we don't have the hindsight to look back and say, you know, that worked, that didn't. These aren't failed programs. None of them got the chance to fail. Some of them may have actually succeeded. But what's interesting to me as a historian, what we can learn from, is getting inside the shoes of the decision makers. Understanding why they were afraid. Understanding why they were so desperate to do these kind of programs. Because if you look back at it in 2019 hindsight, yeah, they seem ridiculous. These are some of the dumbest ideas around. But if we put ourselves in the shoes of someone in 1958 or 1957, and Sputnik has just been launched, and how desperate and afraid we were, or we put ourselves in the shoes of someone in 1943, and the Germans are rolling through the Second World War, then we can somewhat understand why these ideas made sense at the time to some of the most important people in history. So. I'm trying to decide which story to go to. How many people here are familiar with the Plowshare program? That's a, that's a topic we cover in our museum because the Plowshare program, for those of you that don't know, is a program to explore peaceful uses of nuclear devices. Um, several uh, components of the Plowshare program were actually tested on what was the Nevada test site, now the Nevada National Security Site. A uh, sedan crater, which is a National Historic Landmark on the test site, was part of the Plowshare program. But you have a Plowshare story in this book that, that didn't get tested, it didn't quite work out. So I, want, I think I want to God start it there. it didn't get tested, <laughs> right? So the Plowshare program has a bunch of really wonderful ideas, like let's create artificial harbors, let's create passageways through mountains. These are things where you go, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe not using nuclear weapons to do it, but it makes a lot of sense, the end game. There was a meteorologist named Jack Reed who, who was in the Pacific during like the bikini test, during kind of the early atomic bomb testing and then even some of the early thermal nuclear testing. And Jack Reed, as, an, as a meteorologist, his job was to track the direction fallout was going and he 
failed, maybe failed miserably a couple times when follow when directions we weren't necessarily expecting them to. But that was his job. That's why he had a meteorologist out there in the first place. But when he went back to working for the government, not doing atomic bomb testing, he kind of started to put two and two together. He said, okay, I've now seen the power of these new weapons. And my main job is dealing with natural disasters and threats that could possibly be threats to American lives. And so this spoke to me, this program. I'm from South Florida. I grew up in Miami. I've lived through 12 hurricanes. The most damaging of them was Hurricane Andrew, which basically flattened my entire city. Also Hurricane Katrina and a lot of other ones too. Well, Jack Reed had seen a bunch of hurricanes as well. And he thought, we've now created the world's most powerful weapon. Could we put it mano a mano with the world's most powerful natural disaster? Could we use thermal nuclear weapons to either A, blow the heart out of a hurricane and dissipate it and make it go away, or B, lacking the ability to do A, could we blow one up on the side of a hurricane to try to force it to turn and change directions? Now, if you've seen the track of a hurricane, most of them kind of come, let's say this is Florida and this is the Atlantic. Most come straight from Miami and then turn northwards. Almost all of them do. Now, sometimes they'll go straight through Miami and then go hit New Orleans, but they make that check mark. That's because of the, the way the currents of the ocean work, because of things like um, uh, the Florida Strait and some of the currents pushing forward. That's gonna happen almost every time. Well, Reed says, what if I could turn the hurricane before it hit landfall? What if I exploded a very multi-megaton nuclear weapon on the outskirts of a hurricane that would disrupt the rotation and cause it to turn much earlier than hitting Florida or the Carolinas or the East Coast? Great idea in concept. The problem was you couldn't test this in a laboratory. You couldn't test this in a small-scale experiment. <laughs> the only way to actually test if this would work is to detonate a multi-megaton nuclear weapon inside a hurricane. Now, it's wonderful if it worked. Not so great if it doesn't. Because then all of a sudden you have a hurricane already with 200 mile an hour winds, now with all the contamination from a fusion and fission, you know, fission reaction. Um, now, you could argue all you want about how damaging that radiation might be, but no one really wanted to take the test uh, and see what would happen if you had a hurricane that was juiced up by a four or five megaton nuclear weapon. So Jack Reed, unfortunately, did not get the funding that he desired to test the program, but this was something that was legitimate. He, he gave two lectures, one in front of the Plowshare Conference as a proposed idea, and for one in front of the American Meteorological Society. The Plowshare guys were actually a little more open to this. The meteorologists were like, are you out of your mind? Um, what's funny about this is you kind of think, oh, this, this is 1960s thinking, right? No one's thinking like this anymore. Here's my challenge. When you go home, go to NOAA.gov. Right, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and they have a frequently asked questions page. Most of the FAQs are focused on like, how long between a lightning strike and thunder, you know, do you count? Or some of them are like, what is a rip current? Well, one of them on there is, can we use nuclear weapons to disrupt hurricanes? <laughs> so in 2019, and now understand what the F and FAQ stand for, frequently asked questions, <laughs> which means there are a lot of people out there still today asking if we can use nuclear weapons to take out hurricanes. The answer in 1960, just like the answer in 2019, is no. Uh, but it wasn't for lack of trying. That's a great story. <laughs> it's a really great story. So, OK, we thought about nuking hurricanes. What about nuking the moon? Sure. Yeah, so this was um, a program that got really close to actually happening. Um, in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, like I mentioned before. And we were terrified. We were terrified for multiple reasons. One is Sputnik went up into space on top of a rocket that could theoretically be used as an intercontinental ballistic missile. So if you can get a little beach ball into space, it wasn't long before you'd be able to get an ICBM, which would, could come down in the United States. But more problematic for a lot of Americans was the fact that Sputnik demonstrated that the Soviets had surpassed us in science and technology. This is really a problem for the Cold War in a big picture. The Cold War wasn't a battle between the United States and the Soviet Union militarily, as you know. The Cold War is a battle over hearts and minds, and hearts and minds in the developing world, in Latin America, in Africa, in East Asia, in some parts of Europe, that still hadn't quite decided what side they wanted to follow, who they wanted to be friends with. Well, most of the countries 
We're looking, they're going to join the side that's better at stuff. Right? And for years, if not decades, the United States was the leader of the world in science. We invented the airplane, the incandescent light bulb, the atomic bomb, chocolate chip cookies, microwave popcorn, the Etch-a-Sketch machine, the cassette tape. I mean, they go on forever. You know, we were the guys that invented stuff. And the Soviets were most well known for inventing the two-seated farm tractor. That's about it at that point. And so Americans were very complacent in the fact that these countries in the developing world would look to us for science and technology, for like how to go from a developing country to a developed country. All of a sudden, the Soviets had beaten us at our own game. And Sputnik was a big splash because it wasn't just something that could be hidden. You could listen to Sputnik from all ends of the earth. You could look at it through a telescope. It wasn't something that you could kind of brush off. So the Air Force said, we need to do something big. We need to make a big splash. We need to get a, a message to the world that this was a, an anomaly, that this was just a hiccup, that the Americans were the true leaders in science and technology. So what better way to do that than to detonate a thermal nuclear weapon on the moon? And this was the idea the Air Force had in 1958. Now, this would be done on the Terminator, so that's the part of the moon where the light side and the dark side meet up, with the idea that when the five megaton nuclear weapon went off, the sun shining from behind the moon would highlight the beautiful symbolic mushroom, mushroom. cloud on the moon. And then everyone on Earth would be able to see the United States was the big dog on the block. So this wasn't gonna blow, this wasn't gonna explode. No, no, we're not blowing up the moon. We're not blowing moon. up the moon. We're just we want. The, it's a the demonstration, picture. right? It's a demonstration of our strength. It's a demonstration of don't mess with us. Uh, it's a demonstration that the Americans had the science and technological chops that the Soviets never could. Now, incidentally, the Soviets had the same idea at the same time. They were they were not because of spying or anything else like that. But that's not the interesting part of this. Did this they program. know that we were? Nope. No. Okay. Nobody knew anything. It just kind of. And the light bulbs went over to the head at the same time. What's really interesting about this program is it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like no self-respecting scientist would be involved in a program to detonate a nuke on the moon. The guy put in charge of it was a guy named Leonard Rifle. Anyone know that name? Okay, so Rifle was a relatively well-known scientist at the time. He had worked for Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago. The name Fermi might ring a bell. Um, he would later go on to be the deputy director of the Apollo program that actually put people on the moon instead of nukes. Uh, after that, you know, this show is a show called Chernobyl that probably half of you hate and the other half might think is interesting in this room. Uh, after the real Chernobyl accident took place, he was brought in as an advisor for Ukraine and Belarus. And any sports fans in here, anyone watch football or hockey or anything like that? He invented the Telestrator. You know, when, when John Madden wanted to explain what Spider 2 Y Banana was and he'd write it on the screen, that's what Leonard Rifle did. So he, he actually has an Emmy Award. He's a scientist. So this is a, one of the most respected scientists in the American in 20th century. He, didn't, he understood he didn't understand astrogeology well enough to pull this off himself. So he invited in one of his colleagues, a guy named Gerard Kuiper. And Kuiper is a name you might be familiar with. There's something called the Kuiper Belt outside of Neptune, a bunch of comets hundreds of thousands of comets and ice bodies and little things that he discovered that was named after him. And Kuiper came in to help Rifle do this program. Now, this is going to be something that was going to take a ton of math, right? Lots of equations, lots of math. And, and most scientists at this level bring in grad students to do the math for them, right? That's kind of one of like, you bring in someone to do grading for you. A lot of times, a lot of calculations, you bring in a smart grad student to do your math for. And Kuiper's like, I got just the guy. My undergrad, my grad student working on his PhD, let's bring him. His name is Carl. You're going to love him. He's got a great personality. He says billions and billions. Yeah, Carl Sagan was brought in to do the math for this program, and Sagan did it, and they came up with the idea that, yes, we could launch a rocket from, from Earth and have it hit the moon at just the right time so that it would hit the Terminator, uh, where most of the world could watch, and we could pull this off. So it got, the planning went pretty far. Now, here's where I'm honest also in this book, where I don't know why they canceled this program. Because there's no one answer. No one's straight about it. There are a lot of probabilities and likelies and kindas, and so maybe this is why. And most of them come about 10 years after the fact. Mainly because this program wasn't declassified for decades afterwards. So when people were openly talking about it, it was a lot of time had gone by 
before that. The Air Force officially said they canceled the program when they were told, and maybe they should have been told this right away, that there would not be a mushroom cloud on the moon. Mushroom clouds exist in dense atmospheres. Mushroom clouds exist where there's air, right? What's pushing down on the top of that dust and debris is the atmosphere. It's the air that's actually in the atmosphere. Well, the moon is basically a vacuum. So you would not get the pretty mushroom cloud on the moon like the Air Force generals wanted. I don't know why Rifle just didn't go, hey, dude, you're not going to get your mushroom cloud. Maybe because the Air Force is going, how many zeros should I write on this check? <laughs> um, what probably happened was the, if you remember the early space program where the Mercury 8 astronauts and some of the early rockets were blowing up on the launch pad all the time, or they were flying about 100 feet in the air and the rocket would spin back around and come down. <laughs> Imagine if that had a five megaton warhead on it. And I think that the government was like, we're not really sure we can actually get something into space, let alone to the moon. And we're not going to take the chance that there's a nuke on the top of this thing. Um, for the scientists, most of them argue that it was canceled because we went from wanting to nuke the moon to wanting to put people on the moon. And I'm not sure I buy that, because that comes decades later on. Um, but in the end, the program was canceled after millions of dollars had been spent on testing and math and evaluation of this program. So we actually only know about it a little bit because Carl Sagan probably committed multiple felonies. Um, this is a story a lot of people don't know. Sagan at the time was a grad student, and he applied to finish his program um, at, at you know, the first PhD. And when you do that, you give your application. You want your application to look as good as it possibly can. And he wrote that he had co-authored two papers. And the paper's titles were something like, the geological effects of exploding a nuclear weapon on the moon. Oops. Oops. <laughs> and you didn't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out what program they were. Now, the problem is most of the people evaluating his application probably were rocket scientists. So it was very clear to the uncleared people deciding whether or not to hire, you know, bring Carl Sagan on as a grad student, what Carl Sagan had been working on. And so Rifle, three years after Carl Sagan died, so this is only a couple years ago, Rifle came out publicly and said, it's likely Carl Sagan broke a whole lot of federal laws when he applied for grad school. Now, applying for grad school is scary enough, but thinking about <laughs> the fact that you're, you're going to go to prison for 20 years for doing it. Uh, I mean, obviously, Sagan didn't do this on purpose. He was just trying to get into school, uh, which he did, so good for him. Uh, but it's likely that he did a big boo-boo when he included those programs on there. So we may never know that this program existed if it wasn't for the fact that Sagan had breached etiquette and federal law in order to apply for grad school. So what about nuclear weapons and chickens? <laughs> so this is a British story. So there are some British stories in here also. And the British have a very unique way of looking at the world. And the British had a code system for their programs coming out of World War II, where they had a color and a random noun. And they actually called it the rainbow code system. So it was like blue, black, brown, purple, all these different ones. And so there's a particular program called Blue Peacock, which really caught my eye uh, when I was doing research on this. And Blue Peacock was recently declassified, so within the last decade or so. And this was an attempt to create a nuclear landmine. Now they're actually called atomic demolition munitions. And we, we've had them in our arsenal all the way to the end of the Cold War. We miniaturized them to the backpack size to where special operators could parachute in Eastern Europe and plant one of these under a dam or a river or a, a choke point in case the Soviets came across the Folda Gap. Well, this is in the late 1940s, early 1950s, when they weren't backpack size, they were semi-truck sized nuclear weapons. And the Blue Peacock concept was we would create an atomic landmine using a basically a Nagasaki sized atomic bomb. We would bury it in Eastern Europe before the war began. And in case the Soviets came charging across, we could detonate the landmine either remotely or on a timer so that if they needed to cross a bridge or they needed to go across a, a particular like mountain pass, we could either blow that up with a nuclear weapon or irradiate it to where they couldn't go through, or we could flood a valley or do all these other things that would potentially slow down their advance. All good in concept. Anyone been to Eastern Europe in, let's say, February or January or any time in the winter? It is ridiculously cold. 
It is, what the hell are you doing outside cold? It is, go inside in October and don't come out till May cold. And that was a problem for the British nuclear landmine. Not because the munition itself, not because the nuke couldn't handle the cold, but because 1950s electronics had a real issue with cold and temperature. So it wouldn't do you any good if you had a nuclear weapon that was buried at just the right strategic place, but didn't go off because the electronics froze and you couldn't actually detonate it. Now they tried different means and different mechanisms to try to heat things up. One idea they had were, were fluffy pillows. You get a bunch of down fiberglass cup fluffy pillows in there. But they worried about a fire threat, right? If you're talking about these kind of electronics, then even a spark or a, a shortage, you could have a fire in a nuclear landmine that would be problematic. The idea they finally landed on was someone had the bright observation that the nuclear landmine itself was relatively small, but the casing was very big. So there's a lot of decent amount of room inside the outer casing. There's enough room for a couple of live chickens. And if we throw in about a week's full of chicken feed, we can put a couple live chickens inside the nuclear landmine that will kind of walk around and eat the food, but their body heat will actually keep the nuclear landmine at a temperature in which the electronics are guaranteed to work. And this was the concept of blue peacock. And it was well researched and well studied. And the idea behind it was all of us have, most mammals, most birds, we're, we have the ability to, our body temperature can change a little bit, right? If you get hypothermia, your body temperature can go down. Well, chickens have a unique capability of having about a 40 degree difference in their normal operating chicken temperature and when they're gonna drop dead from getting too cold. So they can release a ton of body heat without dying. We, on the other hand, if our body temperature goes down to the 80s, we're in deep trouble. Chickens can go from 115, which is their normal operating temperature, down into the 70s before they drop dead. So there's a lot of opportunity for body heat to keep this thing going. And this was an actual program called Blue Peacock. Now, it never happened only because the Soviets never invaded. This is an idea that was designed, you're gonna pre-position these nukes in case of heightened tensions, or if the Soviets had kind of pulled a bunch of divisions and lined them up on the East German border, that's when you would pre-position these nuclear landmines. And of course, that never happens. And eventually, nuclear weapons technology and the electronics that set those off became more advanced to where cold wasn't an issue. But if World War III had broken out in 1951 or 1952, there may have been chicken-heated nuclear landmines planted in Eastern Europe to try to push back against the Soviet threat. Yeah. How long were the chickens going to live? Just about a week. And then they'd have to replace them. Re well, replace them or use the. I mean, the idea use was the, you, you wouldn't put these out there in to long store term, for long term, okay. right? You would put these out there if you're going to use them or those, you know potentially would use them. So the chickens were expendable. Of course, if they died, uh, didn't die of starvation, you were going to detonate them inside a, a nuclear weapon. I'm surprised so, that PETA hasn't... Like, PETA hadn't existed at the time, so a lot of these programs... <laughs> so these, the the yeah. book is divided into four sections. You've got animal chapters, operations chapters, tech, tech chapters, and then nuclear weapons. And the whole front animal section, as I'm reading it, I'm just like, PETA, if anyone of PETA is reading this book, they have to just be like... The nicest thing that could potentially happen to animals in this book is being spray-painted with likely carcinogenic day glow, glow-in-the-dark paint. Um, everything else was much everything worse. else was, was basically much, much worse. there's actually a disclaimer in the front of the book where where I talk about this you know at the end of movies where they say no animal was harmed that's not this animals were blown <laughs> up <laughs> annihilated cut open surgery spray yes. painted yeah lots of bad stuff bad. Um, but none of these programs actually happened but there's a lot of testing that went on Okay, I want to talk about my favorite chapter in this book, which, which is not a nuclear weapons chapter, but it is a really good Cold War story, and that's Wash Tub. So talk about things that were just declassified. This was just declassified a couple years ago. Okay. And there's still a lot of it that's still classified. And I have the book, because when we get to it, I want to read. Okay. You, you cue me up for that. All right. So anyone seen the movie Red Dawn, either the original or the horrendous remake? Um, <laughs> Anyone remember the TV show Northern Exposure, right, about the Alaskan, do the doctor that goes to Alaska? Well, Wash Tub was basically a combination of the two. The idea during the early 1950s was that the Soviets were on the march, that communism was winning. I guess if you kind of very quickly kind of run through this, you look at stuff like 
1947, Greece and Turkey are having civil wars that were communist. 1948, you have the Berlin airlift, like where Berlin almost falls to the Soviets. 1949, the Soviets get the bomb and China goes communist. 1950, Korea happens, looks like communism is on the march. So it's not out of character and, and completely crazy for American planners to think there may be a World War III sometime soon. And World War III may begin with bombs or tanks across the folded gap in Germany, but it could also include an invasion across the Bering Straits and into Alaska. That's the easiest way for the Soviets to actually get into the continental United States. And we didn't have a whole lot of armies up there. We didn't have a lot of tanks lying now. We still have now Fort Richardson's up in Alaska. It's got half of a division today. So the, so the Russians could try if they wanted to today, and we couldn't do much about it. But the idea was, and this is in a program between the FBI, under the leadership of J. Edgar Hoover, he was actually the one who came up with this idea in the first place, and the Air Force, a new office in the Air Force called the Office of Special Investigations. And jointly, they came up with this program called Project Washtub, which in the intelligence business, we call it a stay-behind program. The idea was to recruit people, backwoods, Alaskan natives, roughnecks, to learn how to become spies. And to do this in, before the war began, with the idea that if the Soviets invaded, they would slip out into the countryside, into their cabins, into the kind of off into the woods, until the Soviets got comfortable. The Soviets would take Alaska. The Soviets would reinforce. They would start getting a little complacent. Oh, really, there's no American resistance against us. We're good to go. Let down their guard a little bit, in which case the stay-behinds would come out and start raising hell. They would basically be like the OSS did in World War II with the French Resistance, or the Special Operations Executive did in World War II, that Winston Churchill famously said, set Europe ablaze. The wash tub spies would set Alaska ablaze. They would blow up buildings, they would assassinate Soviet leadership, they would go and collect information, they would conduct paramilitary operations to go attack Soviet convoys. They would red dawn Alaska. And this is a program that was actually I talk about the fact that these were all canceled. This one wasn't canceled until they had trained dozens of potential guerrillas, Alaskan guerrillas. So they were ready to go. They were ready to go. If World War III had started in 1955, we would have had a trained force of some of the most extraordinary human beings that ever walked the planet. Um, and that kind of can key you up a little bit. Um, the cool thing about this, and I'll, I'll let you read this. So this is who they wanted. They basically, the, the documents exist. The, 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 FBI and the Air Force declassified about 15,000 wash tub documents a couple years ago. And within them is the description from the FBI to the head of the Office of Special Investigations of the perfect candidate for being one of these stay behind sleeper agents. This is a quote. Quote, yep. He is a professional photographer in Anchorage. He has only one arm and it is felt that he would not benefit the enemy in any labor battalion. He is an amateur radio operator. He is a professional photographer. He is, a lic he is licensed as a hunting or fishing guide and well-versed in the art of survival. He is a pilot of small aircraft. He is reasonably intelligent, particularly crafty, and possessed of sufficient physical courage, as is indicated by his offer to guide a party, which was to have hunted Kodiak bear armed with only a bow and arrow. That's the average person they're looking for. And actually, they call that person, this is someone who would be eminently sufficient. <laughs> yes. for eminently the program, sufficient. That's right? great. So this wasn't like, this is the greatest guy we could ever have. This, this is kind of who we're looking for. I don't know how you fly a plane and shoot bears with bow and arrow with only one arm, <laughs> but they, they didn't really explain that in this. And so there were actual people who were recruited for this program. Their names are amazing. One guy's name is Peter Snow. How, what better name is an Alaskan gorilla than Peter Snow? What's amazing about that is every single one of them is basically bear gorillas, like the survivalists that like eat squirrels raw by the side of the road. <laughs> Only the ones we know about are in this book. The documents that have the roster, half of them are still redacted. So the, what's, I want to know who those guys are, right? The if ones they, that are, so, the ones that are so still lethal secret, that you can't. They, they're so lethal that we can't know about them. They're not as cool as the guys who literally can survive on like, 4,000 calories a year. No, it's it basically these are people that we still can't know about because they're probably out there, you know, hunting down bears with their teeth or I don't know what, but there's still a lot that declassified, that's still classified about this. But again, these weren't crazy people that came with these ideas. Obviously, J. Edgar, well, J. Edgar Hoover might have been considered crazy. But the, 
The Air Force equivalent, the guy who was the head of the Office of Special Investigations, went on to become the first director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Right? So these are real prominent people. And this program was only canceled because of the advent of ICBMs. Because everyone realized that World War III would not be fought in the trenches of Alaska. It would be fought in space. You know, it would be fought with all of us fighting you know, to survive after a nuclear holocaust. And that was really the only reason they canceled this program. But for years and years and years, these guys went through the same training as an operations officer at CIA, like what you would get going to Langley or to the farm. Um, the farm is the word they use for the CIA training center. And, you know, again, Northern Exposure and Red Dawn combined together. This is a movie. Well, it may be. It needs to be a movie. <laughs> there may be some conversations about that at some point. So I want to leave time to have the audience ask questions, but I want to ask you uh, one final question kind of as uh, overall. And I mean this as a historical question, not a political question. Several of the stories in this book end up, and you just mentioned one, and you kind of mentioned this in the beginning a little bit. They ended, they were halted because of the atomic bomb. And the atomic bomb worked, we had it, we didn't need foxes to glow in the dark, that sort of thing. If the atomic bomb hadn't worked, or if that had been canceled, would you have put that in this book as a, <laughs> among these? I'm, I'm trying to get a sense no, of I, like, I, like are, are the, is that among, is this one of the examples of it worked? So that was a crazy idea, but it worked and. Yeah, I, I, maybe, I mean, I think that what's interesting about that program is there are options that were thought about during the Second World War that are in this book uh, that potentially could have won the war with less loss of life than dropping the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, what we didn't talk about was to, uh, fixing, um, uh, fixing incendiary devices to bats and dropping them over Japan. And the bats would find their way into attics and eaves and nooks and crannies of the Japanese houses, which were all made of wood and paper. And then when they, the incendiary devices went off, you could burn Japan to the ground without using atomic bombs. And the guy who invented this concept, um, he also invented a fried chicken vending machine. So the kind of genius we're talking about That's here a much better is idea. extraordinary. <laughs> um, swore till the day he died that, that his idea would have won the war faster. I don't know how he went it faster, but he still said that. But with less loss of life. Because the Japanese could have potentially gotten out of the way. Now, if you look at the fire bombings of Tokyo and Dresden and others, I think that's a dubious claim, but it was a claim that was made. And there are certain circumstances in this book where nuclear weapons actually caused the problem in the first place. And not, again, not to make a political answer to this. Um, I, I think that nuclear weapons play a role. Uh, my, my background is nuclear intelligence, so I don't ignore them. Um, you got a guy coming in the fall here to the Atomic Testing Museum, who basically wrote a book that made me who I wanted to be today, Richard Rhodes. You should go to that one if you're here in November. So, and at 10 years old, I wanted to research nuclear weapons. So I'm a person who understands the impact. However, um, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, obviously. You can't uninvent these weapons. Um, but it's clear to me, uh, particularly in this case, in the case of the stories in this book, that there are certain times when nuclear weapons actually caused us less grief than may have been otherwise. Um, some of the programs to um, win the war in World War II probably would have been much more problematic, not, not for anyone in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but much more problematic for our reputation, whether we had decided to use biological weapons, which we never did. Um, I'm a firm believer that bioweapons are way worse than nuclear weapons. Um, certainly during the Cold War, there were times when a hot war would have broken out if it wasn't for nuclear weapons. In particular, some of the plans in this book may have led to hot wars that were avoided because of nuclear weapons. Yeah, that one too. Um, so I'm not a champion of these bombs. Uh, of course, like most of us, I wish that they had never been invented, but it's physics. It's not like you're going to uninvent physics. And so now that they are, we kind of have to understand them in a geopolitical sense. In a geopolitical sense, it's hard to argue even as a historian, and I don't like to look at counterfactuals, the what ifs. I hate those. I mean, they're fun to do in the bar. They're not great to do as a historian. The counterfactual of, well, what if we had never invented nuclear weapons? Would we had a World War III? Probably. Again, it's a counterfactual, because we did. 
and they exist, and we didn't yet. Um, but it's hard not to put a lot of weight on the deterrence capability of these weapons, in particular when we get into the 1980s, when everyone's starting to understand the environmental impacts of these much, much better. Everyone's beginning to understand the, uh, the, the kind of massive destruction that tens of thousands of weapons would have caused around the world. Uh, that kind of makes you think a little twice, a little bit more, more than once about this stuff. 1960s, maybe not, right? I mean, everyone looks at the Cuban Missile Crisis, and this is where I get history on you guys. Everyone looks at the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest we came to annihilating everybody. But I'm not saying we could have won a nuclear war because there's no such thing. But we had a 17 to 1 advantage in deliverable warheads in 1962 against the Soviets. Most of the Soviet weapons may not have worked in 1962, right? So it's not like everyone's going to die. People who survive might wish they were dead, but everyone's not going to die. But in 1983, right, when you're looking at some of the programs in this, like the MX missile and the, some of the SDI programs, no one's surviving a war in 1983. No one. Cockroaches, the joke about cockroaches, no, they're not even surviving. Right? That everyone's dying, and that's not even including nuclear winter and all that other stuff. So do I wish they were uninventable? Sure. Um, but I think there potentially were worse outcomes that may have been avoided by the fact that these weapons existed. You notice how I went all the way around that question without, I mean, going through the middle of that question would have been very political. And I tried not to. Thanks for setting me up for that one. <laughs> At least you didn't ask me the question. I get all the question all the time because in the conclusion to this book, I basically talk about the fact that we don't have any existential threats today that we are super worried about. In my opinion, there's three existential threats that exist today. One is the Russians, just because of their nuclear arsenal. Two is climate change, and whether you believe it or not, science doesn't care what you believe. And three is ourselves. And that's where I get really kind of metaphysical, saying like, if we change who we are as a country, we basically have destroyed ourselves as a country. And that's where, kind of in the conclusion, I focus on the fact that even though 9-11 was not an existential threat, even though Al-Qaeda was not an existential threat, our responses to that were somewhat similar to some of the responses that the chapters in this book had when they were truly facing annihilation. And so my worry is that if we do truly face an existential threat in the future, what are we willing to do? Like, what, what, what are these programs are we willing to dust off again? Or, what or these, what's in development right, that's classified what's in development right, right now, now that's classified. I mean, I know stuff that I shouldn't, you know, about things that, you know, there were, t there were you know, the one that I can, that's now become somewhat public, because I've mentioned it a couple times, is on 9-12, there was a briefing at the Pentagon about creating uh, internment camps for Muslim Americans. It didn't get very far. It didn't get past the, what the hell are you talking about stage, but someone had the idea, right? And that was, that was 3,000 Americans died, and horrible. 3,000 Americans died. But it wasn't like a nuke went off in Kansas City, right? It wasn't like, you know, the Nazis popped back up and were trying to take over Europe. We treated 9-11 as an existential threat and reacted to it in such a way that my worry today is that we do truly get one of those. How would we react? And that's where potentially that one and two, the Russians and the climate change, might lead to that third, where we change ourselves so much that we essentially destroy who we are as a country in the first place. I started to get really serious on you guys at the end. Yeah, we really ended that yeah. on a... <laughs> yeah. We spray painted foxes in World War II <laughs> and, and attached bombs to bats and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, I wanna, I wanna give everyone a chance to ask questions. Are there any questions <coughs> in the audience? Yes, sir. So we have, I'm sure, classical, classic uh, uh, programs that are classified right now and so two related questions. Do you, have, um, do you have a security clearance that you have to adhere to? And then um, if not, can you talk about anything that you run across, such as tunnels under the ground between cities or anti-gravity proposals that came up? So like that? the good news is I don't anymore. And that's one of the, one of the benefits of I purposely uh, got rid of it so I could actually do my job at the museum. I wouldn't be able to do my job at the museum if I had to like make sure I was okay saying what I was going to say. Um, I mean, there there are lots of tunnels, lots of places. Actually, one of the chapters in this book talks yes. about um, a the continuity of government plan in Washington D.C. and the 
uh, proposal to build an underground facility that would resist multiple 300 megaton direct hits. Now, you might know the largest weapon ever detonated on Earth was a Tsar Bomba, which, depending on who you ask, was either 50 or 58 megatons. And the Soviets thought about theoretically creating a 100 megaton weapon, but they were worried they were going to blow a hole in the atmosphere and kill everybody on Earth. So the fact that this underground command center was designed to resist multi-300 megaton weapons, talk about over-engineering something. Um, but this would have been a tunnel system under DC that would have connected the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, basically most of the government facilities inside DC. We also had tunnels that we built under the Greenland Ice Sheet as part of a, something called Project Ice Worm. And this was an attempt to hide intercontinental and medium range ballistic missiles under the Greenland Ice Sheet with the idea that if World War III popped up, they could drive out from under the ice sheet and launch their missiles over the Arctic at the Soviets. This actually was, uh, they, they could have asked a geologist and saved a lot of money because the ice sheet is constantly moving. So they dug all these wonderful tunnels. They created all this infrastructure, a place called Camp Century. They actually brought a portable nuclear reactor there to power the entire thing. I bet the actual the portable nuclear reactor was tested probably somewhere around here. And they built everything from a cinema to a church to a bar to all these things. So, and then within a year, all of a sudden the roofs were sagging. And the walls weren't quite holding up anymore. And they're like, what's going on? And then some geologist said, stupid, it's an ice sheet, it moves. Right? You don't see it moving, but it moves. And so within a couple years, they had to abandon this plan because the ice sheet was taking over and none of the tunnels existed anymore. Now, we thought this was going to be buried forever. You might have seen there's a story from a year or two ago that scientists think in about 50 years, our entire nuclear facility is going to be reintroduced to the world because the Greenland ice sheet is melting because of climate change. And the problem with that is not, there's not nukes there anymore. There was a whole bunch of waste left behind. Not only human waste, which is kind of gross, but also radioactive waste and chemical waste that actually, once it runs off, could run out into the ocean and, and do some nasty stuff. So there's tunnels all over the place. There's tunnels underneath the Soviet embassy in Washington, DC that we dug in a program that's mentioned in this book, uh, where the FBI was gonna try to tap into the Soviet embassy communications and dug a tunnel. They actually, there's two houses. You can still go up and see them today, right outside of the Russian embassy. Two houses the FBI bought, and one of them was used for surveillance. The other one, they, in the living room, they opened a hole in the living room and dug down and then dug underneath the Soviet embassy. That plan didn't work because uh, there was an FBI agent named Robert Hansen who was spying for the Soviets and told them about it. So that, that the, the, they go on and on and on. Yeah, so there's a lot of things like that. Um, and there, there are, 21 chapters in this book, but I had enough information to write 80. And so the 21 in here are the ones that kind of made the first cut. Uh, some of the ones coming from more recent times are pretty extraordinary. Uh, some of the ones coming from other countries, I really focus on the Americans and the British in this case, are extraordinary as well. Uh, and if you guys tell all your friends to buy the book and it makes enough money, I can write a sequel or two to it <laughs> so we can go on from there. Um, but yes, no, I, I, the classification issue is tricky because it means I don't get to see some of the redacted stuff anymore, but it also means I can write whatever I want to, which is a great advantage to have. Yes? Vince, you had mentioned that I, Iran is not an ex existential threat. I want your opinion on this. I mean, because really the existential threat is the proliferation of nuclear weapons, in which Iran, <coughs> along with many other countries, right. Right, but there's 56 countries last the time I heard that have part of the secret that would like to have more uh, and have secret programs. Um, what my biggest concern is that, in fact, I um, built uh, the memorial on Mount Charleston with the help of Cameron here, who's working the CIA. And um, I give docent tours, uh, and they have done that for the history department at UNLV, even. And what I'm most concerned about is the fact that the Americans right now, it is not in the lexicon like it was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yet the threat is so much greater. The, the um, 50 to 58 megaton that you're describing that the Soviets built is so many times, I think it's like 3,580 times more powerful than um, what happened in Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. 
the threat is so much greater, and yet our youth are, are being born today in this world that there's a massive target on them, and it is an existential threat, and yet Americans are completely oblivious to it. We're in this complete bubble. And so it, it really concerns me that, that not enough attention is paid to it, um, and the, the need to support the intelligence communities, the need to support thinking out of the box sometimes. That I think these things that you're describing, these programs, as ridiculous as they are, I think we're primed to have a lot more of those coming up, and some of those may be the very things that save us, right? right. No, and, I, and I th I'm never one to say you should not pay the intelligence community more money, but they are, they've got all the resources that they need. And they'll always say they need more. Um, one of the interesting things about CIA and about NSA and about all these other agencies is we don't read a lot about how well they're doing things, and that's on purpose. Right? The successes are not advertised. The failures get advertised, you can't hide the failures. But the successes aren't advertised. I mean, I talk to people all the time like, oh, everyone's hitting us with cyber. Why are we so behind everybody on cyber? I'm like, dude, the reason we're not reading about our successes is because we're so far ahead of everybody in the realm of cyber. We do it so well that no one knows it's happening. Right? I mean, and that, that's, that's where I guarantee you people are thinking about that at the agencies. Not just, I mean, NRO is a great example. NRO, they just sit and think about that all day. Right? How can they create new technologies that will help us avoid exactly what you're talking about? DIA is another great example of that. Uh, our new museum, we have an unattended ground sensor and DIA, from DIA in our, in our exhibit. And it's a small one. It's just a rock that was used, placed on the Afghan-Pakistan border to pick up terrorists walking across. But they have much larger ones that are being used to pick up vibrations from underground nuclear tests. That's how they tell what North Korea is doing. And also, what we call massants in the intelligence business, measurements and signatures intelligence, is how we pick up on facilities that aren't doing what they say that they're doing, like Natanz in Iran. Like, oh, it's just a peaceful weapons, a peaceful energy program. Well, we can figure that out. We, that, the, that's why, and I, I'm not gonna get political, the JCPOA, which is the Joint Agreement with Iran, the reason the CIA supported that was the fact that we're pretty confident we can tell if there's cheating happening or not. And so I, I, I agree with you that the kids these days have no idea about, I mean, I used, when I taught history at the University of Maryland, especially when I taught Cold War history, I did a whole class on nuclear weapons. And these were three-hour classes, so it was a three-hour nuclear weapons class. And I laid it out, and they had no idea. Some of them were like, we still have nuclear weapons? Like, yeah, dude, we still have nuclear weapons, right? You know, um, and here's all the different ways they can kill you, and here's all the different ways they were developed, and here's all the things that we have to worry about. And they were, their eyes were just like this. And it's like, just in just a couple of these, right? I mean, people don't necessarily understand that concept either. If, if India and Pakistan have a regional war and launch 30 weapons at each other, that could be it. I mean, even if you don't really buy into the whole nuclear winter philosophy, which I do, but even if you don't, that could be it. Because all of a sudden you have all the countries ending in stand and all the countries in the Middle East that are joining on the side of Pakistan. And all of a sudden you have all the countries that are supporters of India, which is you know, United States and others, be potentially being pulled into a war. And everyone who says a regional war is never gonna lead to a world war, the Balkans in 1914, right? I mean, that's, that's not the last time and it's not the first time. So I agree on one part of it that the younger folk these days don't quite understand the threat. I disagree that we're not prepared to deal with it from an intelligence perspective. And every single day, scientists at IARPA and DARPA and others are coming up with innovative ways to do this. They're thinking way outside the box. Yeah, and so half their programs may end up in my sequel one day. Ben, so, so you, you're confident that, that we have the capability to stop the nuclear prolifer proliferation? We have so far, right? I mean, if you think about the fact, how easy is it to make an atomic weapon? It's not that hard. Right? I mean, it was a Glenn Seaborg who said the only secret of the atomic bomb was whether it would work or not, and that was proven in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right? The physics were understood in the 1930s. Right? I mean, there's a Boy Scout who made a nuke. All he needed was a plutonium core. Right? It's a great book if you haven't read it. It's not that complicated. So the fact that the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and, the, and the, the pressure that the P5 have put on their other countries, I mean, there were at one point to the 70s, the 80s, there were about 20 countries that were on their way to a nuclear weapon. Brazil and South Africa and Saudi Arabia and others, and they all gave up their programs. So something is working. 
whether it's international condemnation, whether it's pressure, whether it's buying them off with money or with peaceful nuclear power or other things like that, it's working. You get these rogue states, you know, like the Norks, like the North Koreans, who are gonna do whatever the hell. You could argue the North Koreans developing nuclear weapons as a deterrent against us. Now, that's not a politically correct argument, but if you ask the North Korean leadership, that's exactly what they would say. Iran, you could argue, is trying to develop a nuclear deterrent against us and Israel, who's had nuclear weapons since the 1960s at the latest. That's problematic. It's not, you're not going to have that argument anywhere in public and get away with it. But the idea is that's what certainly the government of Iran would argue. And, and I, and I, but I don't disagree, and this is a long-winded answer to a straightforward question, that if Iran did develop a nuclear weapon, how destabilizing that would be. Uh, because the Saudis would follow suit, and then you'd have a free-for-all. Um, but I do trust our intelligence agencies that were able to prevent that from happening. I mean, we already did our once. I mean, the Stuxnet virus was pretty damn effective. Yeah. And if, if, you, if you don't think people are thinking about stuff like that now, yeah, I, got, I, got a bridge, I got a bridge to sell. I realize they, they yeah. are, but if, if, they're not be, if they're not successful, you know, we're all here today because there have been programs that were successful. We may not all be here right now. And if they're not successful, well, then the alternative is we're not here. So, I mean, there's no, there's no failing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been true since the beginning of time. time. Yeah. Yeah. We must also keep in mind that deterrence works and it's on the minds of leaders of those countries okay. and decision makers. So it's not like, oh, they get a nuclear weapon and we're fried. Right. Deterrence works for, for nation states, right? I mean, the, the, the number one primary mission for Kim Jong un and for Ayatollah Khamenei is self preservation. And the idea behind that is don't nuke somebody because they know we would turn their country into a parking lot. And we can send the Marines in to paint the lines for us. We never have to worry about parking anymore. Now, deterrence works with symmetrical threats, with state actors. It doesn't work with asymmetrical threats. It doesn't work if ISIS gets something or Al Qaeda. Now that's unlikely to happen. It's more likely that a terrorist organization gets their hands on a chemical or biological weapon. Um, but that could be particularly problematic as well. I'm not, yay, scary. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, just c close your eyes and, and read the book and you'll feel a lot better about life. Um, but yes, so here's a way to feel better about ourselves. Are we almost out of time? Okay, so Jordan, her birthday is today. <laughs> and and I, feel like, I feel like there's no way we should end this without singing happy birthday to Jordan. Are you guys with me? All right, ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jordan. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. If you have books, Vince is going to sit at this table here. Feel free to come on up. He will sign them. As I mentioned, if you don't have a copy with you, we have them for sale in our store. You can pop in there and get it and come back on in. Thank you so much for being here.